right now, US venture capitalists are sitting on 290 billion dollars in dry powder. We had talked about this last year, how much dry powder was there. The market has obviously collapsed. Um, but here's a chart uh, from our friends over at PitchBook. It's just extraordinary how much has built up and how much has been raised. US VC funds raised $121 billion during the first half of this year, 2022. So LPs uh, still have an appetite, which kind of makes sense that investing into the down market for private companies means you're going to get better deals. Uh, and you have a 10 year horizon. US VCs raised 139 billion in all of 2021. So if you put those two numbers together, yeah, you're looking at $260 billion in the last 18 months. And this is all record numbers being put up on the board. What does this say for private companies, Sachs? I um, dispute this analysis a little bit. Um, I think okay. there's a couple of things going on that need to be taken into consideration. First of all, new funds don't get announced till after the process completes. And then, you know, it may even be some time after that when the VC firm feels like they want to make the announcement. You can't announce a fund until the process is completely over. You get subject to all sorts of additional SEC rules. So, you know, these funds might be announced in 2022, but they may have actually been raised in 2021. So that I think is a really important point. Moreover, a lot of the funds may have already deployed capital before the crash. So there was that, I think, remarkable story that we talked about months ago in TechCrunch on how the latest Tiger Fund, which wasn't even announced till March or April of 2022, but it had already been two thirds deployed by the time they even announced it. And so that was pretty stunning. So I, I think that we don't really have a great sense of um, how much of this so-called dry powder has already been deployed, how much of it was really raised before the crash. It is true that LP relationships with VC firms that have done well are sticky and good LPs stick with their partners during a downturn. So look, I mean, the VC world's not going out of business or anything like that, but I would tend to think that this is an overly optimistic, overly rosy scenario. Do VCs have new funds that they're going to be ready to deploy in great companies? Yes. But does this mean it's going to be easy? No. I think that the bar has gone up. Valuations have gone down. Founders looking at th this tweet storm, I would not get lulled into a false sense of security. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Just to explain that, there's probably a six-month lag on when these funds are announced. The reason is there's 506 B and C designations most people raise under 506b which means you cannot even say that you're fundraising therefore pitchbook can never have that data so there's a lag and people were deploying at a very high velocity therefore this number could be off 35 well if people were deploying at a pace where they thought they were going to go back for a new fund every year which is what it was looking like in 2020 <laughs> 2021 yeah. you know if that six month period might mean you've deployed half the fund right. so um mm. But look, if if you just go back to a two and a half or three year pace of deployment, and before in 2021, we're at a one year pace of deployment, divide the availability of capital by two thirds. I mean, you know, only one third as much will be deployed in any given year. That's a you know, significant reduction. So, um, yeah, I think founders should just be aware that the market's going to be a lot tighter. And I think given what we're seeing in the public markets this week, it doesn't look to me like it's going to get any better. I, it looks to me like we're headed for, I mean, I called a double dip recession, I think a couple of months ago. That's exactly what it's looking like. In fact, the Fed basically said as much. The Fed said that would be just marginally positive next quarter. So would bounce back to slightly positive growth on a real basis, but then, you know, expect it to go negative again and, you know, recession once all these interest rates kick in. And by the way, I mean, kudos to Chamath for basically calling that, you know, when the Fed just a couple of months ago was saying that so-called neutral would be three to three and a half percent, Chamath was saying, no, it's going to be four and a half, five percent plus. Now the Fed just in two months has revised to saying that neutral is 4.6 percent or something like that. And, um, and they don't think there's going to be any rate reductions in 2023. So this is not looking good. How much Chamath of the issue here is? We don't, the, the data that we're seeing, the ground truth we're seeing, as you would often say, uh, might be very different than like the reports that are coming out. People are talking about inflation from, you know, 60 days ago, job reports that are 30 days old, 60 days old. We don't really have live data. It seems like our government doesn't use live data 
when they make these decisions? Is that they accurate, unfortunately well they unfortunately don't have access to it really. You know, they are they have empirical sampling. Um, but to say that, you know, the the US economy is automated in a way where, you know, they can sit in front of some dashboard and, you know, see in real time what the true on the ground data is, is is not really accurate, unfortunately. Maybe there's a Manhattan project type, you know, effort to do that at some point for the United States, but it's not now. Um, I'll give you uh, a bit of bad news and a bit of good news. Uh, and this is just me kind of, you know, again, looking at the mosaic and, and kind of judging where we are today. The bad news is I think that it's going to be a really tough, sticky time for the US consumer probably over the next 18 months. And so I tend to think that, you know, through the course of this year and through 2023, and possibly even a little bit of 24, it's going to be a grind. Unemployment will go back up. Inflation will be sticky. Real earnings will shrink. Consumption will uh, ebb. And earnings will not be that great. But the silver lining is, I think that we are starting a bottoming process for the equity markets. And I think that by the end of this year or the early part of next year, most of that will be done. And the reason is that, you know, the equity markets, I think, do a reasonable job of one, looking at the bond market, and then two, looking six to nine months into the future and pricing in that future today. And so by the end of this year, beginning of next year, I think that we will have kind of bottomed and we'll start to build a base. The thing to remind us, though, is that, you know, let's just say a stock goes down 20, 50%. Even if it rallies 50% from there, it's still 25% off from where yeah, it is. Yeah, people don't understand that. And people don't How understand that. to climb back up so, the mountain. So yeah. I, I would just, I would just think, you know, um, tell people that, you know, I think that David is right. I think that it's going to, uh, we're going to feel this for a while. Um, it's this inflation, as I've said for a long time, is going to be sticky and persistent. I think you're going to see Fed funds at or breaching 5%. And, uh, but I think that in terms of, you know, risk assets will bottom out by the end of this year, beginning of next year. Freeberg, what are your thoughts? You think we're in the process of bottoming out and it's going to be a year of this kind of slog through the muck? And what signs are you looking for that maybe we're getting out of it or turning a corner? I mean, Larry Summers had some good tweets this week the weird you know the weird thing is larry Summers seems to be like almost trying to make the case and make certain points because he's not being listened to <laughs> I mean, uh it's 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 so ironic and sad to watch uh because he's such a thoughtful economist and has such a a, a great point of view and experience at uh to leverage here and clearly you know he was banging the drums last year and no one was listening and then he got public about it and now he's more repeatedly public about things the point that he's made which i think plays into the the political cycle question which is where the tension arises is in order to resolve ultimately uh the inflation problem you're gonna have to see a significant increment in unemployment and and so when you raise interest rates uh you know generally purchasing goes down demand goes down, revenue goes down, layoffs happen, uh, some businesses go bankrupt, etc. So then there's this trickle in the economy of, of less people being employed. And when that happens, it ultimately drives a political response, which is, hey, we're losing our jobs. People start asking their representatives do something about this in Congress. And then these programs and these things get passed, which themselves are inflationary. And that's why it's very hard to predict ultimately when and how this all gets resolved because we seem to have an administration that is enacting and um, embracing uh, inflationary policies to support what they consider to be economic growth and um, improved employment conditions in this country. And the unfortunate effect of many of those policies is inflation. And then it forces this difficult central bank decision making cycle. And so there's a tension right now that doesn't seem to have a clear path to resolution that um, is why it's very hard to, to have a clear prediction here. We also have a very significant question overhanging 
uh, all of these markets related to the price of energy, which is a key input to so many industries and, and, and drives cost, uh, as well as food, and also the military conflict in Eastern Europe. And, you know, we've, and, 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 and then there's in the financial markets, this big overhang question on what's going to happen with various countries that may default on their debt, as well as China's real estate bubble bursting. So I made this point, I think, a few episodes ago, but there's no easy answer that I can just say deterministically, here's my prediction of what's going to happen. Uh, as Chamath uses the term, I think it's a great term, there's this mosaic of things that are under, under consideration right now, and there's a tension between them all. Uh, and, um, and that's what makes it difficult. I'm sorry, I didn't really answer the question. But that, that's, that's kind of how I there's think a about lot of, it. There's a lot of geopolitical risk. 